I'm going to tell you a story about a tree. It's an individual species no. of tree. It's a Are Modesto it's ash. And what's special about this tree was in 1927 in Modesto, California, there was a large planting of trees at Westside Park. And one of the trees, they thought they were all Arizona ash, but one of them was different. It was a strange variant. And they recognized this as a unique species and they thought it was impervious to insects and impervious to decay and they named it Old Granddad. This is Old Granddad and I think this picture was from the 60s because the tree looks like it's about 30 years old. So my story goes on to another Modesto ash in San Jose that was planted in 1938. And sadly it reached a point of no return. It has Don't way like too it. much decay in it. So I'm going to tell you the story here. Um, this is me up in the tree doing the removal. I'm using the rings to support a lot of these branches. I couldn't let things just fall because there was neighboring trees. There was plants in the neighbor's yard. I didn't want to mess up their lawn. And the street was freshly paved. So there was a lot of concern in the area. So I decided we'd better rope almost everything down. Not everything. So I'm going to go along and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and you know how I'm doing it. Obviously I'm cutting my wedge and I've got the ring there on the other side. I had to hold the rope back. I put it behind my shoulder because it was just cutting too close. And it worked out really well. Very, very smooth. Oh, this is kind of interesting. This part of... Uh, Willow Glen has, has got something very, very strange. They've got they've got these rubberized sidewalks out here. And the, you're going to be blown away when you see what happens here. Check it out. I can't believe it. I did it again. That rubberized sidewalk just caused everything to come right back to me. And third time, uh, enough of that joke. <laughs> Editing fun. That was uh, kind of a little bit of a challenge to do, but I, I enjoyed doing that. So getting back to this tree, I bid this as a job that would take a day and a half. I want to show this to you. There's lots and lots of decay, lots of insect activity. There was tree was full of carpenter ants and termites, and I didn't know what was strong and what was was weak so I opted to do as much as I could with the bucket truck and this one I made a choice to try one big drop I thought okay this is leaning over the street how bad can it be and I was kind of reluctant to do it because I was looking down at that brand new fresh paver the paving the black paving there and I didn't want to dent it. And I thought, well, if I lay this one down flat, it, sh it should be okay. Well, I did. I laid it down just perfect. But unfortunately, there was a lot of white marks from where it hit. Didn't dent the street. Didn't damage the street. But um, I didn't want to leave a big mess. So we decided that we were going to rope everything else. All the wood, everything was either roped down or we built a big... Uh, wood pile at the base of the tree and we're throwing pieces down on top of it. Switching to the 200T, my old 200T. I've also got a 201. But I like my old, I've got three old 200Ts that are still working. You can't can't buy these saws anymore so if you've got an old one they're worth restoring. One of them has a new cylinder and piston. I like to tie the clove hitch for my knot. Jorge always ties a running bowline. And I learned a long time ago that the, the clove hitch is one of the few knots 
that stays in position and then tightens up as weight is put on it. The running bowlin um, could possibly come loose. You know, it's just it's a it's a knot with a with a loop, and the pressure holds it. Rarely does it come undone, but I learned the uh, the clove hitch years ago, and it's just it's just a habitual knot that I tie. Note that I was able to slide the ring down. I didn't adjust it so tight that I wasn't able to keep moving it down. It's uh, it's kind of a pain if you have to tie it and untie it. There's the uh, there's the clove hitch. It's a very simple knot to tie. But you do have to put a keeper on it, either a half hitch or a, a, a double half hitch. It's an easy knot to screw up. And I've seen uh, people make mistakes with this knot where it, it unwrapped itself. So be sure you understand that knot if you decide to use a clove hitch. I know it very well. Uh, when I see it tied, I, I just absolutely know that it's right. So I, I feel really good about it. It was kind of a fun job. Like I said, I bit it for a day and a half, and that included hauling all the wood away. But we were running into things that made it a little bit more difficult. Originally, when I bit it, I thought I'd crash a lot of stuff, a lot of the branches on the street. So roping it down took us a bit longer. Uh, the decay in the tree that that had me kind of going. So uh, I was being a little bit more cautious. Here's the, that clove hitch again. Simple knot. I think I tied two half hitches on that one just to get the tail out of the way. You'll notice I, I make my cuts different. Oops, it happens sometimes. I make my cuts differently for different locations and different branches. Sometimes I'll just cut it all the way through and I'll cut it fast, knowing that the rope's got it. Sometimes I'll put a wedge in it. Sometimes I'll just put a back cut in it. Um, it. It all depends upon how the branch or the piece of wood is situated. Here I've got to be real careful because it's awfully close to the rope. And that clove hitch holds up really well. Notice the uh, the, the board that I put on the back of my bucket to hold the chainsaw. There's a couple of adaptations that I've done to my bucket that I believe are are very useful. It makes it much easier to work with, with saws up in the bucket. I've put a hook on the other side to hold the, uh, the heavier saws because those slots are too difficult to get a long bar in and out of. But the, the short chainsaw is my electric saw and the, the 16 inch bars. They fit in those slots quite well. I've got one on one side and one on the other side. One fits in sideways. That's actually good because I can reach it from the ground so I can put the saw into the bucket before I climb up to get up in there. Lots of little tricks that I've learned that I've adapted to. You know, everybody does things different. You know, you're, if, if you've been doing tree work for a long time, you'll probably look at this job and say, Oh, that's not the way I would do it, or why don't you do it this way, why don't you do it that way? Well, like I said, everybody's different. And it's going pretty smooth. I've got Jorge roping for me, and I was trying to teach Eric a little bit more about roping, so further on, I'll show you Eric doing some of the roping. And he made a few mistakes. Um, he's getting there, though. He, he, he doesn't understand how to judge weights of branches very well or wood. Not being a climber and not understanding from the climber's perspective, it's a little bit tougher. So here I switched over to a bigger bull rope. Went out and bought a brand new bull rope recently. And I was this was a little bit sketchy for me. I wanted to make a great big cut, but I wasn't really confident of the other side because well <laughs> there's lots of little decay pockets in this tree you know you can you can see little spots that you know from that picture earlier you'll see that there's uh, um, insects there's termites there's carpenter ants and they're not easy to identify there we go look at that 
that you know that could have been a real disaster if the part that I was roping this big limb to uh, wasn't strong enough to hold it. So I I just wanted to explain this a little bit. Um, I made the back cut, but I was also ready with my hand on the lever to back off quickly if if I was concerned about it. And I got to the point as soon as it started to go, I pulled my saw back. And I did. I backed off. I backed over so that if there was any kind of a problem, the bucket would not have been under the branch. And I'm using the GoPro camera, which kind of foreshortens everything. This is actually quite large. It doesn't look that big in the uh, in the picture, but it's it's about oh, it's it's over 20, 25 feet long. So Eric had to go over and get a chainsaw and. We had to just hold it there and he was cutting off pieces so we could lower it down it was just too big to lower straight down onto itself and that's what I got done before lunchtime so all that I got done in the first half of the day and then uh, Jorge opted to go up I couldn't reach this other part with the bucket so he said he was going to go up there and climb it I wasn't exactly sure how he was going to do it, how high he was going to go. And like I said, I was a little apprehensive, so we did look it over real closely when we got on that side, and I inspected Let it when I had the bucket bit, up there. Eric. I Run couldn't find him. any obvious decay pockets, but you know, there was a lot of surprises in this tree. A lot of areas that I thought were sound were completely and totally rotted. Like I said, this tree was planted in 1938. No so this was one of the earliest examples of Modesto ash. This may have been one of the oldest Modesto ash uh, from the original plantings in San Jose. Uh, there were six of them planted on the street and the entire street was nothing but the sycamores, the, the London plain. But the mayor lived at the house where we're working and we go. The, uh, next door to him was the city horticulturalist and and he said, I want to do Good. something different for for my trees and the neighbor's trees. So there was a whole neighborhood of sycamores and six Modesto ash. There's only two left, and after today, uh, there's only one left. The last one looks a little bit better than this one. There weren't any really obvious big decay holes, but uh, we shall see. So he's doing pretty good. That was one of Eric's mistakes there. He didn't think that was too heavy, so too he heavy? opted to um, just hold on to the rope rather than put it on the porter wrap. That's a peak cut. And he did burn his hands a little bit through the gloves. That's not a small one, Jorge. That's heavier than you think. It's heavier, it drags him across the yard. But generally, I jump in and I grab the rope, but he's got it. You gotta learn sometimes. You gotta, you know, if you don't do it, you can't figure it out. So I have to give Eric more opportunities to learn how to rope. And he's doing okay. You know, he's letting it, letting it fly. It's, Let he's it go, not hanging quick. it up. He's not hitting the climber. Uh, he's not letting it go all the way to the ground. This one I wasn't too comfortable with. I was watching hard and I thought, I don't like the way you've got that rope set up. You've got it rigged to the branch behind you. And I'm watching that, but I don't, I just don't like that cut. And he opted to send it back over him. And you'll see what happens here. He doesn't get hurt, but he could have. He, the rope went over his chest. That was, in my opinion, that was a big mistake. He kind of poo pooed it. You okay? It's no big deal. But you really don't want the rope to come out. And there's his cut. You can see he made the undercut and then he came in from the, from the top, but the undercut was not appropriately placed. So it ripped rather than cutting evenly. And there we go, the end of day one. So here's the morning of day two. I got up back up there with a the bucket truck and started off with one big cut. Dropped it right on the wood because I really didn't want to put dents in the, the new surface or in the new road didn't want to hit the curb 
I had one area of sidewalk that they were going to replace. You can see that area that's ra that's raised up, and it was all marked. So on any of the pieces that I was throwing down, that was my, my target at that one spot on the sidewalk. So we ended up splitting everything for a couple of reasons. The most important reason is where I live, getting rid of firewood is kind of a problem. If I called and I put an ad in the paper for the wood and I didn't cut it, cut it up into small pieces or split it, nobody would take it. The dumps are charging me a fortune. Yeah. You know, one dump load, one truck load, the small truck load full of wood is about 400 to 500 dollars. And they, they charge on weight and, and they don't like the big pieces. So I opted to, I, I decided to fill the a truck bit, up yeah, with a bit more. some, some of the split the pieces to give away. Some of it I was going to take home. Uh, I threw a few logs in there that I'm going to mill up. And then we put the word out and I had, oh, I think I had four or five pickups show up throughout the day. And we were able to get rid of... Um, of, of all the wood, with the exception of, of one load of wood that I ended up taking home. So, this is a little bit different. Um, you're probably wondering why I don't start off by cutting a notch in the back side of the tree. Well, if you come in, if you've got plenty of wedges, and the tree is leaning a little bit, but I opted to make one final cut at the bottom here and put wedges in it to keep from pinching the saw. But I'm going to show you this this whole um, this whole series right here uh, with, with very few edits because what I did should have worked out perfect, but what I didn't understand and what I didn't um, think would happen or I didn't anticipate was the amount of decay on the inside of the trunk. So the here's my here's my procedure when I make a, a cut flat all the way through. First thing I do is get a wedge in at the back, and that keeps it from pinching the saw as you go further forward. Then I had a number of steel wedges, and before I get all the way to the end, I put a wedge in on the side and a wedge on the other back side so that the weight of the log tips back just a little bit. So I usually cut all the way down to you know three quarters of an inch or so before the, the bark, before I pop my uh, my final side wedges in. So here I am going all the way down. I'm, I'll just let you watch this for a little bit. Yep, he got stuck. I, I wasn't even near the end. What happened was the wood at the end of this trunk was so decayed, instead of it supporting the trunk, it crushed down and pinched my bar. That's an expensive bar. You know, it's a, one of those feather light bars on my new 500i, and I didn't want to bend that bar. Plus, I needed the saw to finish the job off. So, I was a little bit frustrated with myself here, but it happens. But it's, uh, it's, it's important to know how to get out of these situations. Wedges are really, really valuable. You should have plastic wedges for when you're cutting near them. And the steel wedges are also useful. Sometimes we cut wooden wedges. Yeah, 
Grab that saw, would you? Pull that saw out, Jorge. I was checking for the zombie. Uh, that's all right. Okay. Get that saw. Good. Oh. I got to the end here. And it was all rotted. The whole basement seems rotten. Good. Watch out. Wow. So much decay. <laughs> Look at the ants. Water me, Gus. Oh, yeah. There you go. It's a lot easier like that. No, that's good. I just wanted that to roll off of there. There was a lot of internal decay on this tree and much of it had turned to dirt. So cutting through it with a chainsaw, it dulled our saws, which kind of slowed things down because we had to keep stopping, putting an edge back on the saw to keep, keep working. And also being a city street tree, you can only imagine how many lost dogs, birthday parties, um, something for sale signs have been nailed to this tree for since 1938 so we hit all kinds of metal in piece in uh, cutting some of these sections down so we kind of messed up our chains it was a bit of a pain I want to show you a couple of uh, close-up stills here of the uh, the decay that shows you there was actually roots on the inside of this tree there was so much old rot that turned to dirt that the tree had rooted on the inside that was living off of the uh, internal decay there. And uh, this is, oh, that was so much work. Just so much work. We ended up splitting everything. That's uh, getting closer to, I think that was about one o'clock in the afternoon. I've got a whole bunch of malls, splitting malls. They go from a six pounder to this one, which is a 12 pounder. And the 12 pounder is a real difficult one to use. Eric could never use this big bad boy here. Show us what you made of, Jimmy. Um, it ultimately ended up breaking the handle. 12 pounder, you've really got to know what you're doing and, and you've got to have the right kind of swing. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. He went back to the other, other mall. And here's the old man splitting wood. But this little ash is pretty good to split, unless it's got crotches in it or, or the, the grain runs out sideways. did my share. I know I split at least a third of all the wood on this job. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say we got a solid three cords out of this tree. So we each split a cord of wood by hand. And that was what we left. There was somebody saying he was going to come and pick up the last bit of it. And there's the wood at my house. It snowed. <laughs>